Current estimates hold the population will reach 9 billion by 2038. One of the major problems we face is feeding everyone. Diseases are at an all-time high. The current model for food production is unhealthy and unsustainable. There's got to be a better way. Scientists say that if 14% of the world planted a permaculture garden or some type of garden just in their backyard, we can replenish the entire earth. So we're setting out to find people who are doing things differently. We'll be looking into alternatives to current food practices that are damaging our health and environment. We'll be meeting the chefs, farmers, restaurateurs, and entrepreneurs who are making a difference. And you'll find out just how easy it is for you to become a part of the solution. Check us out on Facebook and Instagram. Hit that like button, subscribe, tell all your friends. We'll be eating the freshest food, meeting amazing people, and seeing what we can do to become a healthier, more environmentally friendly world right here on The Fork and Truth. One of the major hurdles to overcome in the creation of a sustainable world is educating primary producers. So how can we educate people about sustainable practices? Well, stick around because on this episode, we're visiting a place that's doing just that. Hey, Jerome. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for coming by. Yes, this is, uh, we're at Central Rocky Mountain Permaculture. I'm the, the director and founder of, of One Acre Forest Farm here, a forest garden and edible landscaping. And uh, we have 5,000 square foot of greenhouses. We have a, a tropical greenhouse, a Mediterranean greenhouse, and three other ones that are used for nursery and uh, annual production. Uh, so I'm going to give you a little tour about um, what our systems are here and some of the forest garden, what's, what's fruiting right now. Okay. Um, we, uh, we have a 6.3 kilowatt power plant up on the roof. Uh, we catch um, almost a lot of our water off the roofs and use it for irrigation. Uh, we have a, an edible landscaping nursery, a composting toilet. Uh, this is our kind of our outdoor kitchen here where we spend a lot of our time uh, having lunch and, and enjoying the, the produce from the, from the farm. Right. These are all of the uh, insectivory plants over here and uh, medicinal plants that bring in the pollinators. Uh, we have a problem this year, uh, first time ever with pollinators. Uh, I think our wild pollinators have just taken a dive huh. from about you know 90% to about 30% from from the last 40 years. Right. So we're not sure what that is all about. We we've, we've never relied on honeybees. We've always relied on wasps and beneficial insects. Okay. Um, so let's go into the Mediterranean greenhouse first. All right. And uh, have a look at that. So uh, this is an attached greenhouse and uh, it has Mediterranean plants in it, right? Uh, this is the perennial uh, polyculture on this side, which is um, Pakistani and mulberry, uh, rosemary. These Pakistani and mulberries are my favorite. They're early in the spring, they're about this big, big around. And then we have tomatoes, all salad greens during the spring, all kale. Uh, we also have a lot of insectary plants, the uh, tinted geranium. Uh, we just finished up with a lot of cilantro, and it's now going to seed, and then we'll reseed some of that. So um, there are multiple yields here in a, in a uh, forest garden. It's not just an annual garden where you just have annuals and you go harvest them. There's a, there's a kind of a, what I call stream of consciousness gardening here. So we, first of all, we we harvested the annuals in here, then we transferred into a, a heat-loving crop. Um, these were all used for salad green and these uh, cilantros. And now we have uh, parsley in here as an understory, and we'll be putting in uh, a medicinal herb, uh, uh, spilanthes, in here as a second crop. So we're always uh, rotating and interplanting uh, with a forest garden especially in the greenhouses. And the outside is more closed canopy. But, um, and this is also a uh, chop and drop here. We have a uh, comfrey that we grow using it as different kinds of fodder and mulch. Uh, we can use this as mulch here. 
or add uh, add it to our um, um, animal fodder. So there, there's all kinds of chop and drop here. Uh, woody material, grape vines. Uh, so there's there's a constant flow of mulches and a constant flow of of food for the animals and a constant flow of food coming in from um, from chop and drop. Let's. Uh, there's the fig tree over there, which used to take over the entire greenhouse. Now we cut it back. There's a pomegranate in here, as well as an olive. Cool. And this is still this is a fig tree. Huh? This hasn't come on full fledged here. There are some figs on the old wood, but uh, we'll uh, we'll be having figs later on the year on this one. In the tropical greenhouse, we have a fig tree that's going to be earlier that we'll be eating early. We actually freeze about um, oh I don't know six or six or seven gallons of figs a year and we use those in smoothies all all winter long now you just missed uh, the big flush of Nanking cherries oh wow on these trees but you can uh, are they tart or are they sweet no they're or? they're go ahead and help yourself they're um, when they're this far along they're almost like a sweet cherry mmm those are delicious. Yeah, and we have about wow thirty bushes of these. We have the weeds we have here are, are usually used for either salad greens or um, animal fodder or mulch. So that's why lettuce, garlic is is a weed here as well. So we'll be harvesting those to use in stir fries, garlic tops, and uh, I'll show you my favorite tree up here. Where my favorite fruit is mulberry, and. Uh, this is just coming out. We just finished uh, fruiting, but you can try some of these black ones here. Mulberries? Mm -hmm. This was just loaded uh, last week, and mm. there's still quite a bit of fruit mm -hmm. on it. Um, what's nice is it's slow release, so you you can fruit you can eat fruit off of this for about a month and a half, two months. And we have six or seven trees like this. And we have four or five varieties that are coming on. Different kinds of mulberries, bigger, bigger, smaller, uh, white, reds, black. Uh, this is just loaded, but uh, fortunately it's kind of on its way out. But uh, And the birds get the top ones and uh -huh. we get the bottom ones. Um, we'll head down to uh, the tropical greenhouse. Okay, here's an, uh, an heirloom apple here that's fruiting uh, pretty heavily this year. Uh, this is a full-size apple. Uh, grapes along here, using the vertical space for getting more production. Uh, there's mints, astragalus. This is Siberian pea shrub. That's our native. Not our native, but our introduced nitrogen fixing tree. Okay, so we're just picking the, the St. John's wort here. We also have a tincture business here, so again, uh, uh, we should see a lot of pollinators. We should, this is a wild bumblebee, mm -hmm. but we're not seeing them this year. Huh. Uh, and they weren't here this early. We had a wet spring cold wet spring so we only got about half of our trees pollinated this year um, but with over 150 varieties you know we can hedge our bets we're not just planting peaches you know if we miss that pollination we'd miss everything so Diversify. having a diverse planted landscape like we have here with multi stories kind of um, um, hedges our bets so Alex is picking these flowers here and they will be put in uh, organic alcohol. Yarrow is another uh, medicinal herb that we uh, use for teas. And um, that's, that's also a, an insectary plant that brings in pollinators that go into the greenhouse to help pollinate the greenhouse. And we let our sunflowers go wild. Uh, these are just volunteers. Uh, so we're just trying to 
get as many flowering plants in the system throughout the year. It's really important to have them in the spring, summer, fall, uh, perennial and annual. And you see every, oh, every yeah. wall is planted with grapes. We have about uh, 25 varieties of grapes here. Most of them were put in here 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, most of them are wine grapes, uh, but we use them as table grapes here. Um, this is a this is a blue dansom plum, and uh, it'll be ready in about two or three weeks. Uh, we have about seven, eight varieties of plums. Okay. Uh, most of them are fruiting this year. Plums did pretty well. Uh, we're going to go this way. There's an apple tree there, and another plum tree. Uh, Lovage is a is one we sell to the restaurants, and um, this is made into a sauce or a pesto. It's is a, it's actually a, a celery substitute. Um, we will cut wow, this. Smells, yeah, it's really strong, isn't it? That's good. And like we'll that. cut this back and uh, use it um, as fodder or mulch. And uh, this is. Um, Marshmallow is another medicinal herb that oh, we Oh yeah, it's great for the intestinal tract. Uh -huh. Yeah, and we go this way and then we're gonna... So this is like a, a 20, 20 year old French wine grape. Um, we just trellised it a couple of years ago and brought it off. So as these uh, landscapes mature, they become like a closed forest canopy. Uh, this is a black walnut. That's an Asian pear. There's an edible crab apple there. There's currants and gooseberries. Black locust is one of the companions for black walnut. Mulberry over there is another big mulberry tree. This is a black apricot, which is a cross between a plum and an apricot. And then we have comfrey and other things, and um, Egyptian onions. Uh, chives, all those kind of ground covers. Everything, the way we build soils here is mulching and worm farming and using mycelium. So if we can look over here where the mulch is more prevalent. Hey, that's the kind of soils we're building. Yeah. Um, wow. And we also just, as as uh, as we run out of mulch that we bring in, we also can cut this comfrey and just keep laying it down. So we're growing our own mulch as well, right? Hmm. As well as uh, bringing in mulch, and this is really high-valued mulch. And that this will grow about three times a year, and we can just keep coppicing it back. We make big barrels of tea and. The, um, and another way we grow worms is in the pa in these buckets here. So uh, we take one of these buckets. You can dump it, and oh wow! Yeah, you see that's oh yeah that's this wow. this happens in our pathways in the greenhouse, but this is a way to grow worms. Just with whatever material you find, rabbit manure and kitchen garbage or, you know, slop buckets from the kitchen, mm -hmm. and you turn it into a worm farm, and then you can sell these at the farmer's markets and um, use them for taking out in your garden, making uh, more, more worm farms. So um, we actually teach this during our class. I'll show you in the, in the pathways how we do that and okay. do commercial worm, worm cast. So there's sweet cherry down there, another mulberry, uh, there's a um, peach cot down there, another walnut, this is catnip, and uh, we have another patch, we have another patch of nettles over here. This is another one we sell to the restaurants. Yeah, we make pesto out of this. It's perennial vegetable, so we have lots yeah. of perennial vegetables in here and biannual vegetables that we don't have to plant every year. That's the key to forest gardening is that you, you have a lot of things that just keep going. Mulberries. Um, a jungle of food. It's a jungle of food. There's uh, 
um, the raspberries have taken over. This is another sour cherry that we have. It's called Bale. We have three varieties of sour cherry. Now, this is coming on heavily this year. Uh, this will be ready in about, uh, you know, two weeks, three okay. weeks. So they're just so, hard and real tart now, I'm guessing. Yeah, well, they are tart, but they're, they're green. Um, but uh, they get pretty ripe and sweet when uh, when when the sugars get... Um, yeah, they're they're coming on, right, right. We'll have that for our big academy class coming up in three weeks. So here, as you can see, there's just kind of a, a continuum of raspberries here. Uh, they've taken over here, hollyhocks. Another grape. Uh, seedless grape. Uh, wisteria. More chop and drop. This is another one that we use for coppicing as well as this the Siberian pea shrub. So we can coppice this and um, and use it for mulch or use it for uh, eventually we can save the seed or eat the seed. This has a, an edible pod on it as well. It, it's like a mung bean. Huh. And basically you can dry that and use it as a, as a, as a bean. So you're growing your fodder, you're growing your nitrogen. Right. You're growing food, and you're growing a bee fodder. They have a really nice pea flower, and the bumblebees like it. Do you set these up throughout? <coughs> these are kind the of forests for are, nitrogen givers. Yeah, about every about every uh, every two fruit trees, I might plant one or two nitrogen fixing trees, and in they're always mixed in in the in the in the whole guild. So and guild, they're complementary. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, a guild is, we have these guilds here. Uh, every terrace pretty has a different guild. So we have the overstories of, of being a plum and then Mount Mahogany is a native nitrogen fixer. And we have a dwarf cherry here. And a vining element is, is, is uh, clematis. Uh, we have clover as a uh, medicinal herb here, which is astragalus. Uh, this is a wild plum here. So we're coming in here, we have every one of these terraces is a different guild. This one here is uh, Green Gauge Plum, with the Siberian pea shrub next to it. There's Hollyhock here, this is a, an apple that comes from East, German, East Germany from the experimental station. This is goji berries. Now, we not only eat the berries, but we take the leaves and dry them for teas. So we have another yield there. And there's a, there's a good for uh, salads or teas, actually. Um, there's a tree I use to graft uh, different varieties of apples onto. They had to take out some apple trees. And uh, in order to preserve them, we grafted a bunch of them and put them in a park in Carbondale uh, at an heritage park, uh, the Thompson Park. And then these are the three or four varieties that I grafted from their best trees. So th that this is like a, a gene pool for yeah. for different, different old varieties of apples that have been here in the valley for 150 years. Big old trees that are either dying or they needed to be taken out. So it's just another way of um, I brought plums back from Montana. I did grafting workshops there this spring. Yeah, another Nanking cherry. There's a huge grape on this um, chicken house here. Uh, it's a Reliance grape, and it's just loaded with grapes. Hmm. That's that's a goji berry, it looks like. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's that's not fruiting. Yeah, there are some goji berries. They're not, they're not quite ripe yet, but you can try one of them. And they've gone viral, and in a sense, they've really spread a lot. So, which is good about that is that we can actually um, 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 dig up the plants and sell them in our nursery. No, that's pretty nice, huh? That is. That is very nice. Here's another astragalus here uh, as, as a ground cover. This is a, a lo this is one I've been eating and selling to the restaurants. It's a um, auric that I brought from Calgary about oh, 25 years ago, and it has a, usually gets a leaf bigger than this. So it's quite tasty for salad. Um, we have huge patches of it over by the hot tub. Mm. 
another mulberry tree here. Help. Uh huh. Help yourself. It's just coming, just finishing up, but it was loaded last week and the week before. So if this can be done in the high altitude and maybe the drier soils of Colorado, I mean, is it possible to do this almost anywhere? Oh yeah, forest gardens are universal across the world, you know, especially in the tropics. And well, we have a tropical forest garden in the greenhouse, mm -hmm. I'll show you. Which is, all you're doing is taking the, the plants that are going to grow in that area and then combining them into companion in guilds basically this is a, a mirabella this is a big fat plum uh, and there's another as we this is kind of a plum guild with a um, a pear overstory horseradish is a ground cover and also a perennial vegetable uh, just walk along here and we just keep stumbling into different food systems and um, uh, you can see the garlic here is a, uh, this garlic um, my aunt gave it to me about 40 years ago and I've been growing it here ever since and it actually is kind of a weed here so but we're, we're managing to get it out this will this will we'll probably harvest these and we can use those in stir fries uh, once they dry nice. out they, you can just shatter and then you don't have to actually peel them oh yeah you can actually just uh, throw them in a stir fry they break apart and you can have you can have you know mm. two bangs for your buck here. With uh, that's elderberry that that's we really make nice. a lot of syrup from right there. Mm. Here's more astragalus here going to seed. Um, right here, this is going to seed right here. So we're going to be harvesting that seed. All this right in here. Here's another really special plum here called Mirabella, the Nancy. This one here, it's got small plums that come right very late in the season and they're very sweet. In Europe they make a brandy out of this. Oh. Hollyhocks are just coming on, give it some color. Oh, pears look great. Um, here's a couple of different heirloom apples here. Oh, those are great. Yeah. Now we didn't get fruit on everything but we got fruit on maybe 40 percent this year. Last year it was a bumper crop. If you have some sort of climate change phenomena coming on, you, everybody does. Uh, this year for us it was pollinators. We don't know exactly why, but uh, that we, you know, we got hit with with lack of pollinators. But um, so this apple tree has five varieties grafted onto it, and they're all fruiting. I think we're going to go. I want to actually go over on this side here of the pond. Now the pond is a big watering hole, and it's nutrient-rich water as well. Just don't want to fall into it. Uh, you can see the dragonflies coming on here, and they are. They help with the fly control and mosquito control. Mm -hmm. um, we have lilies in here, duckweed. We scrape off the duckweed and the azola. This is azola here. And um, an it's an algae, yeah. Is it and there's uh, not not for us as far as I know. And the duckweed is. Uh, we usually have ducks in here, but we don't have ducks this year because we're trying to get our lilies back again. So that's the older part of the forest garden up in there. There's hazelnuts, uh, hardy pecan, uh, edible hawthorn, which we make medicine out of, but we also eat the fruit, like a big fat rose hip, and it's very sweet. Uh, here's a, here's that lamb's quarter I was showing you about here. It grows everywhere, like weed. And we were selling this to Tabasco all spring. Another perennial vegetable here is uh, Perennial broccoli, and um, I got this from Eric Tonsmeyer. Eric was an intern here back in the 90s when we were just doing market farming here. And we harvest this, but then we also let it go to seed. So we have a huge seed crop for perennial broccoli. <laughs> this is a chestnut. So we have several varieties of nuts, and they're just starting to, some of them are much bigger, some of them are fruiting, but this is just getting established now. You guys get a good amount of nuts? No, we're not not yet. Not yet. Yeah, we will potentially. This is a wild current here, hmm. which is golden current. We let a lot of these things go for the birds. Quite tasty, though. Oh, it is. Boy, those currants are sweet, aren't they? Oh, they're good. 
I think that'd be great in a salad. Right. Um, <clears throat> now, we just took out a huge box elder here that shaded this area. Well, this is mostly for medicinal herbs, but that's a plum peach cock. That's a three-in-one fruit. It's a natural cross that just happened here by, by accident. And um, so it has a unique fruit and not a lot of fruit this year. It has all the variety, all the flavors of plum, peach, and apricot in one fruit. And uh, we graft that onto, uh, there's a white Nanking cherry there, which is the only one I have on the, on the property. And it should, uh, probably not ripe yet. Oh, it's very late. They're still sour, but. That's okay. What's nice is because, you know, they kind of, it's like a time capsule. It's a jungle of raspberries, goji berries, um, and uh, other medicinal plants, pear. Oh, wow. Wow. Oh, yeah. So it's like a, a fairyland. You get kids in here? Oh. They go wild. Mm. It's Willy Wonka's yeah. fruit it's factory. Finding yeah, look this at, is amazing. Look at the grapes hanging out over there. That's so cool. They're taking over that whole fence line. And Alex is pruning these. Man, these are great. They're amazing. Unbelievable. And this is just a minor fruit. This is not where you... But you can make these into a hedge row and prune them down into a hedge. Mm. I've seen this done in Carbondale. And when they get this sweet, they're just really, really, you know... Look at that handful of cherries. Yeah, yeah. There's a whole bucket here in there. <laughs> So when did you start all this? Uh, we were market farming here for about 15 years. All of these were, oh, there's chestnuts coming on. Huh. Yeah. That's great. Uh, you want to see the grapes here? This, this tree, this grape used to go all the way to the top of that pinion tree and we cut it back, brought it back to a trellis. Oh, the Asian pears are coming on really nice. Here. And uh, there's blackberries right here. Oh wow, yeah. Coming on. The bees Another. love those flowers, huh? Yeah. Blackberry. Yeah. Raspberry. And more grapes and more Nanking cherries. And then we're not going to go up in this area, but this is a jungle of food as well. This is a beautiful white grape here with really tight clusters. That is true. And look how the, the, the garlic is just coming up. This will be a huge clump of garlic. And you see all of it has to be terraced with stone. And this creates a whole other microclimate. We grew annuals on these terraces for a while and then turned it into perennial polycles. We still grow some annuals on these beds here. I'm just eating my way through. One of the techniques in permaculture is using water to get double sun. So in the spring, there's no duckweed here because it's still dormant. The sun comes in here, glances off the water and hits those stone walls, stone terraces, and they collect it. So it's just like a microclimate. We're getting like a zone 6B there. So we can grow hardy pecan and other things that are more tender up there. Blackberries fruit better. And, um, so just creating microclimates, we have all these microclimates, since we have this a ridge and a, a gully here, it creates a lot of different opportunities, uh, aspects, which we can turn into microclimates. So usually what I wind up doing is eating the fruit around the sun. These will still be sour. Oh, that's okay. But, um, They're getting the afternoon sun and they're ripening because it's hotter than the morning sun. So this is the side we'll be eating first. Dun, dun, dun. This is a, two citrus here, oranges are fruiting. Uh, we just take, had a few we come off. This is a kind of a perpetual crop of oranges. Uh, it seems for this edible cactus. This is four or five varieties of edible cactus. Uh, kumquats behind you there. 
We have a compost tea machine, a commercial one, and have two different varieties. And this is like the bag after the compost tea has been made. And this is what's left over. And it's kind of like the placenta, right? Mm -hmm. And I, uh, <laughs> I, I put this in a special place. Um, I've got this young mandarin tree here. I'll just dump it right in. Yeah, I give it a little bit of tender TLC. Yeah. I'm going to put that back, mulch back on there. A new citrus that I'll give a little Terra TLC too. Here's um, one of our medicinal herbs that we collect um, um, flowers from. We make salves out of the flowers. This is calendula, but we also collect the seed. So this the seed is coming on really strong right now, so I'll collect that and we'll sell that on our seed company or use it for uh, planting out more. <coughs> we sell seeds as well. Okay. So this is a, this is part of our insectary plant too. This is Cuban Cuban oregano. Ooh. It has a really Cuban oregano? Cuban oregano. It's in the camper family and it has a very distinct Oh yeah. Um, we can make a tea out of this mm. for white flies. <sighs> This is our cactus area here. Some of it's medicinal, some of it's useful. useful. That's a ter oh, just a root pepper, hot pepper. Uh, this is a uh, one of many varieties of papaya that we that we've grown out here. Wow. This one's ready to come off. Oh. Yeah, this one too. Yeah, and then this is a another variety that I just cut off. And it'll grow back again. It's, this one is called Red Lady. Another new tropical tree is called Chipotle Cava. Chipotle Cava. Yeah, it's a, the fruit actually grows on the. I think they had that at Grimmel. On the on the trunk itself, a living soil, basically. It's about 20, 29 percent organic matter, which is too high actually. So I've been trying to get it down with cover cropping and mulching with wood chips and stuff. And there's pomegranate here. It's a dozen up there. Yeah. Yeah. They usually get nice big and sweet. Oof. We show photographs of how we use this area is covered with passion fruit. Other times we've grown uh, lima beans here to shade this. We really needed to shade this out a little <coughs> bit more. It's actually cooler in the greenhouse than it is outside <laughs> uh, because of the natural convection. And we don't use any fans for the most part in the summer. We were able to cool it naturally. And this is the climate battery technology that we've developed here over 30 years. So this basically takes the warm, hot air into the soil with a fan right here, with different settings. It actually cools the greenhouse while it's warming the soil. And then at night, the same fan with a different setting will turn on at 45 degrees and bring the temperature back up about 10 degrees. We have this gabion wall here that is uh, huh. always taking on heat. We have a pellets, so that's the climate battery, then the, the thermal mass, the climate battery, then the, the pellet stove, which um, is our next line of defense. If it gets a little colder, we, we need to maybe do the pellet stove. And then if it gets really cold, and this is our book on forest garden, indoor forest gardening, called from Chelsea Green, and these are some of the other books that have come out with people who have been involved with Crimpy here. This is Eric Tonsmeyer's oh, cool. new book on carbon farming, yes. and uh, he's got several books out. Peter Bain has been involved in Crimpy here for years as a teacher and a supporter. We're featured in his book, we're featured in Toby Hemingway's book, uh, Gaia's Garden, and we're also featured in uh, Edible Forest Garden at co-authored by David Jackie and Eric Tonsmeyer. So this is this is one of our thermal masses here. What's nice about this wall here is it not, uh, doesn't always just heat the first two inches of the rock, it actually heats the back of the rock because when this rock heats up, it conducts warm air to the back of that wall and it heats the whole, it heats the whole wall. This will just be, I usually have a hammock here in the winter time, if I can sell. So the next uh, heating system oh, here is, the, here, uh, is the, the sauna. 
another few logs on the on the stove here in the stove and put a small fan here and it blows hot air out into the greenhouse for 24 hours. These walls are insulated really well. They got five inches of concrete and and the marble. And I did do my Bikram's yoga there in the winter time. And this is our smaller version here. It's a 60 gallon one and then we have a 250 gallon compost tea machine. There's a commercial one that we do off-site compost tea. We're doing this weekend we're going to be doing a, a one acre forest garden up at 8,000 feet. We're going to be spraying it doing foliar feeding. Hmm. So we foliar feed this about once a month uh, outdoors and indoors with compost tea. We just coppice this down. This is completely uh, taking over the whole landscape and then we just took and um, had our our class chop and drop this and um, again here so you can see where it's been laid down we're making all this mulch um, also feedings are out this is uh, hemp CBD hemp um, these are all anti-inflammatories yep CBD hemp this is turmeric Oh, nice. There's uh, Spilanthes in here, which is just starting to take on. That's another one we use for a medicinal plant. Uh, this is Moringa, which is used for tea and uh, it's a very powerful uh, medicine. I wonder if it's going to benefit doing the turmeric next to Well, it, it actually does. That would there, there's special there's plants in here that I planted here. This is a Roman chamomile here. Ten years of, of mulching and chop and drop and yeah it's, it's all just worm casting basically oh, there's a worm there yeah red worm and we're worm farming in the pathways here huh finished compost or finished worm casting that's those are worm castings that we just harvested from these beds from these wow. pathways right here so rather than just compacting your pathways and we were using my pathways twice three times right I'm growing worms and I'm growing finished compost. We can sell this for ten dollars a pound or whatever, you know. And we just harvest we just harvested this and redid it during the design course, okay? So it's just starting to break down, but you can see what this is the kind of stuff that we're this will break down into what I just showed you. It'll take about three months. And then it'll be that. And we can just harvest it again. Um, we have mushrooms growing in here. And we also spread these around. Very earthy. Yeah, these aren't necessarily edible ones, but uh, they all the mushrooms have a beneficial relationship with plants, just like the microbes. The mushrooms, the microbes, the mycelium, the microbes, and the worms all play a part in flaking down soils. <coughs> Lots of things coming on up in here. This is my sleeping platform here and, uh, for naps and uh, yoga. And there's a ladder there. And these are our drawing racks. You see, there's not a space that's wasted here. That's a young tropical cherry tree. And that's our nursery for figs and tomatoes over there and more. This is Cherimoya. That'll be the canopy. There's four, five major trees in here that will be the new canopy. So it's a succession. We have a lot of uh, lace wings in here. So we don't have insect problems. Per I, I was going to say, I don't notice really any yeah. insect issues. Well, you know, if we do, we monitor them. We, we take them out. <coughs> if we have a few aphids, we always have a few aphids, and we always have a few things. But we keep an eye on it, and don't let it to get out of hand. We just pull the plants and feed them to the rabbits, to the chickens, or eat them ourselves. And then get the numbers down there. Keep this balance between the good insects and the bad right. insects. Do you have any praying mantis up here? Or? No, we don't have. <coughs> I've seen one in... 25 years or 30 okay. years. Um, we don't have ladybugs either this year, oh. for the most part. Uh, but we do have lots of lace wings, and they live. They lay their eggs underneath the leaves, and then they're doing all the predation.
Now Thanks we should be seeing a lot more bees here, but we just don't see them. This is all rootstock and some Nanking cherries, some apricots. And so this is a, a blonde beautiful. mulberry, which I co we call the Salt Mountain Bliss. Now, if you can reach down, you get the. Uh, if they're just cream colored, they're going to be good. If they're if they've got a little bit of pink, they're even sweeter. Fruits are all on it. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Oh wow. We get we get the red ones. They even actually get purple. So good. This is another graft that I did. I brought some heirloom uh, plums from Montana and grafted them onto this American rootstock. And they all took plum tree kind of as an overstory with raspberries as a midstory. And we, we harvest these and freeze them and we have people come and make wine out of the choke cherries. Uh, but the birds just are loaded up here during the choke cherry season. Now there aren't many choke cherries out and about this year because of who knows what. We don't know why that. You see, we have a sea of sunflowers coming on here. These are all volunteer. So this spring, this was all kale, kale and salad greens like this. And this bed is just on its way out, but we're still eating kale here. Uh, and this red Russian kale is just amazing how it can handle the heat. There's a couple of cannabis in here, but or hemp. Uh, but these are tomatoes and cucumbers that we're already harvesting and basil. There's about five different kinds of cucumbers in here. There's, there's the Armenian one and, this is a, and the basil. And again, this is very, very heavily mulched. And look at that soil we're building. This is actually built with hygge culture. Almost all of our beds are built with hygge culture. We put wood down in the beginning and then we, big branches, and then we just layer organic matter on top of that. So we have the mycelium going. Look at that. See, that's the wood that's in there. That's what your, you know, that's your biochard. See that? That's living soil. So there's really no composting off-site. That's kind of a strategy that we've taken on. Mulching, sheet mulching, culture, all of those techniques are used depending on the time of the season and what the bed needs. Uh, the bed hasn't had hygge culture for a couple of years, so we would throw some wood down and just stack it back up again and plant right into it. In fact, we just did that here. We harvested salad greens out of here and laid them down. And then we put some wood on top of that. And then we built it up with um, different horse manures. And then we put spilanthes in it. And you can see that's a uh, Armenian cucumber there. That's they're a cross between a melon and a cucumber. We just picked this up a month ago or less. It's been sitting in somebody's yard for nine, ten months. Uh, they save them for us, so we have summer mulch. What part of the pile you go, it's very broken down, so we always have stuff we can add more. As this mulch breaks down, we can add more mulch, right? So most people throw away their leaves yeah, they and throw put them in the trash bags. To the landfill. The best thing to do with them is to put them in yeah, and around put your, right on your garden. Yeah. Your garden. Yeah. And it conserves water, creates a habitat for the beneficial insects and, and the microbes and mycelium. Hmm. And uh, oh, this is a whole bunch of squash plants. Look at that. We can plant the, the kale and lettuces and greens in the, in the spring along with the uh, cilantro, which we let go to seed. And then we sheet mulch it again and put in the heat loving plants in November. This will freeze out and then we'll bring in our nursery. That's what we use. And they're always that. switching. They're always transitioning from one crop to another. That way you're always building soils and you're also hedging your bets against insect problems. Now if you try to keep this kale in here for a long time or if you try to keep tomatoes in here for a long time, you'd have more challenges huh. with insect problems. Okay. But rotate. You rotate. And that's what nature does, right? And we can plant we can mimic nature. 
This is my nursery here for uh, spilanthes and uh, chamomile, and uh, this will go in some more basil. This will go in and fill in the, the spots that aren't uh, productive. This is the favorite tree for the turkeys, this Russian olive here. It keeps its fruit during the wintertime. And so in the wintertime, the turkeys are up there eating the fruit. So this is just, oh, it's just only about not even half full. So this is filling up with gravity full, gravity water coming from way up on top of the mountain, up above Ginger and Rob's. Now we've got a, a grant from the Forest Service to limb up the dead branches. Um, to reduce the fire damage or potential damage here and uh, then we just laid those out on the contour different strategies here for building terraces these didn't even have any um, digging at all we just put tea stakes in and threw some branches against there and then sort of sheet mulch and then we planted our our crops in here we've been growing vegetables in here now it's more of a, a perennial plant a cover crop in here as you can see the comfrey is different things there's actually a, a, an apricot tree down there and sage and uh, that's pretty much gone viral on its own it's pretty much done what it's what it wants to um, uh, every one of these terraces has a different uh, palette and a different way of designing so we're going to walk up and see how we design different ones and in between, uh, the, the native vegetation is, is taking advantage of the extra moisture. It's a bit dry right this time of the year, but come along pretty well. We'll probably plant some of that, um, that perennial broccoli in here and see if we can get that to grow as a, a perennial vegetable in here. These are some of the older swales that have more mature trees. This is false indigo, which is a natural fixing plant. These are elms and Siberian pea shrub. <coughs> and you can see the ground covers have come in pretty because the deer and the and the turkeys use this as a kind of a foraging area. Um, mainly to green this place up and make it less more fire prone. So if a fire comes down in here, there's not as much fuel, and right. also it's greener and wetter. So it would be a buffer. When it hits that road, it still is going to have to go through the edible force to get to the house. Yeah. So it's it, it it's really, a, and we're only doing minimal work here. Even without the water, it would it would make sense to do this. Now all of these have been terraced over the last two or three years. And you can see where this one is really closed in and as, as they seep and spill over in between the swales uh, have been revegetated. This is black locust. There's uh, Russian mulberry in some of these. There's comfrey, fetches, clovers. Um, and the wildflowers are doing better. So this is the idea, just to, to green it up, get some uh, diversity in here. When you look over there, you can see how very little right. is growing over there. Yeah. Of course, there's no water over there. <coughs> I can see a little bit how this one got planted. Just these branches got laid on the contour and the ditch gets dug on the back side, and that's a mulberry tree right there, and a Siberian pea shrub, so, and, a, and a comfrey, and there's some other stuff in there. So there's a guild right there. That's part of a, an emerging food forest. And every one of these has a variation on that right. theme. And it's again, we, we use this as part of our uh, training field for when we do our Earthworks. Mm -hmm. Avery Ellis does a, a sh sets out either a 
an A-frame or a laser and shoots all of these grades and then we do all the handwork and people learn how to reseed and plant these things and uh, maintain them and uh, it's just uh, and I, I love it because the, the deer and the wild turkeys come through here and, and this is their place to hang out uh, they don't come into our, our, our food forest uh, you always have you know on a farm you should always have a little sanctuary for for the wildlife because they're part of right the, part of everything it's the soul of the of, of the place you know the soul of the universe you don't have the birds and the bees and the and the wildlife you, you know it's very sterile yeah and if you can if you can cohabitate with them and give them something I go I walk up here and I see the turkeys I see the deer hanging out and um, you know, it's, it just feels good to have a have that uh, space for them to to do what they want. And Crimpy also has workshops and, and things yeah, like that. We have our design. Uh, we just finished our tw thirty seconds annual design course, and then we have our academy coming up on the seventeenth of this month, which is an eight day course, four days on uh, forest gardening and four days on greenhouse design and maintenance. It's more hands on. We're pretty much out in this garden, these greenhouses, or other gardens and greenhouses in the valley, other forest gardens. Okay. Right. So we're touring, we're seeing what what's on the ground, kicking the tires, yeah, uh, seeing what's actually uh, you know working and what's not working. And again, you know, uh, I always try to look at the glasses half full because this is a pretty bleak year for us. Even though it looks lush in there, mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a lot of production. But you know that's just the way these things go. You don't. Last year, last two years, there's the bumper crops. Um, so you just have to go with the flow. Thank you so much, Jerome. All right. I appreciate it. Great. This is a truly magical place. Great. Where yeah, you can I'm just walk around came. and constantly eat. Thank you all very much for joining us. We'll see you next time.